Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, he is using all of us today to crack the image of Islam. my fellow Muslims now and I, I want to bring them to know the love of Christ. They're not slaves, they're sons and daughters of the Lord who loves them. Jesus pays a price for me to go to heaven. And he pays for everyone here. My friends, the mission field is here. Tell us about good news about Jesus Christ. If you put your trust in Jesus, you will go to heaven. Who will share the gospel with the Muslims? If you guys are silent, how people will be saved? As he, uh, as he comes out, we'll introduce you to him. Uh, Pastor Rick has a saying. He says, if you're going to be a bear, he said, be a grizzly bear. And so Daniel Messiah is just that in a very gentle way. So let's uh, give a warm welcome for Pastor Daniel Messiah. Praise the Lord. Hey, they told me the second service people, almost the faithful group in the whole church. And you, you need to prove that to me. You know, we need to stand, and uh, when I count three, we will shout, praise the Lord, and we need to shake the building, okay? Don't worry, they have insurance for the building, okay? One, two, three. Pray praise the Lord! Wow, praise the Lord, give the Lord a hand. Have a seat, please. I am proud of the second service. Don't tell the first service, I told that. I am delighted to be here this uh, morning, and uh, thank you, church. You have a very wonderful church, and uh, Pastor Rick and his staff, and, you know, Kelly, and uh, Pastor Gordon, and, you know, everybody here, you know, the worship team. Uh, it's awesome, and the people in the back, you know, they suffer with me since yesterday, you know, but they did a good job. Could you please give a hand to your church leader? And I can't forget Brother Marshall, who is taking me all around the city uh, since yesterday, and I discover he has an Egyptian blood in him because he drives like Egyptian. <laughs> you know, the minute I, uh, I sit next to him, I said, wow, I am in Egypt, you know? <laughs> and uh, I will tell you a true story about how Egyptians drive. Uh, when we came to the state here, to San Diego, uh, I have an old uh, station wagon, uh, 1975, was five gears, and we're going through the Highway 15, going to El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego, and this exit is like a big hill. If your car is not brand new, you can make it, you know? And uh, my fifth gear broke, and number four broke, and number three broke, and number two broke, and the car starts shaking, and finally number one broke, but I start thinking like Egyptian. I said, I still have the reverse, it's still working. I, I, I uh, put the car on the reverse, and I start driving backward. All cars with the front, mine with my back, you know? Don't try to do it, only Egyptian can do that, you know? <laughs> How many of you guys heard Egyptians are funny? You know, we are the very funniest people in Middle East. That's what they call us, you know? We consider like Hollywood for Middle East. 
And I will tell you a true story uh, about that. Uh, in uh, uh, 1984, my wife and I, we tried to smuggle like four or 500 Bible in my car, in my trunk. And uh, uh, I invited one American uh, missionary to come with us. He was scared and you know, his face was red. He said, you are crazy. Uh, we will, uh, they will arrest us. We will spend time in prison. I told them, don't worry, you are an American. Worst case scenario, they will send you back to America, but me and my wife will end in prison. Don't be chicken, just come with us. <laughs> and uh, he came, I forced him, you know, and uh, we started approaching the border of Morocco, and all soldiers with guns, and they stopped my car, and I look at his face, you know, and the guard asked me, uh, where are you from? I said, I'm from Egypt. Immediately he said, tell me a joke because they know we are funny people in the Middle East. And I started thinking about the joke, and I shared it with him. He started laughing and laughing, and he told everybody, open the gates to this guy. And they never checked my trunk, and we took 500 Bibles to the people in Morocco. And that's how I got the name, open the gates, from. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Like I said, uh, I am delighted to be here, and uh, I have good news for you. You know, God is working in the United States and overseas uh, among all nations, you know, especially among Muslim nations. Uh, I came uh, from a trip uh, to East Coast a couple of months ago. Almost uh, I speak in uh, 16 churches, and it really touched my heart to see how Americans are serious to reach out to Muslim. And they wanted to be bold to take the gospel to the people around them. You know, uh, over 200 people during uh, this time uh, got saved from different churches. And uh, over 700 people attend our training on how they can reach Muslim. And thousands of people came forward to be bold to share the gospel with the Muslim without fear. And you can always go to our website, openthegates.org, uh, and you can get update on the newsletter. We run out of the newsletter uh, since the first service, but God is really moving uh, in Middle East, and uh, your media here are deceiving you, and your media is spreading fear to your heart. And I feel American churches here afraid to share the gospel uh, with Muslims. And I wanted to encourage you, my friend, today that the Muslims are very open for the gospel than ever before. Uh, I am a missionary for almost 30 years. And I go to Middle East, to countries in Middle East, in uh, Africa, in uh, Jordan, in uh, different places in Middle East. And I see millions of Muslims are coming to know the Lord. And the passage the Lord put in my heart to share it with you this morning is Isaiah 60, uh, uh, verse 4 and verse 6 and 7. If you open your Bible on Isaiah 60, you will see the Lord is telling his people, lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Lift up your eyes. My friend, like I said, your media deceiving you. They didn't give you the, uh, what God is doing among the nations. And Christians are afraid to share the gospel. But Muslims are open for the gospel uh, in a way it blow our mind. And I will show you DVD this morning uh, and you will agree with me, today is the day of good news. And we remain silent. In verse six, the multitude of camels will cover or shall cover your land. I don't think the Lord is interested in camels, but when he said a verse like that, he interested in the people riding the camels. 
And the meaning of this verse is, a lot of Muslims will come to United States. A lot of million of Muslims, over 15 million Muslims are in your backyard. And the Lord brought them uh, with a multitude of numbers uh, to your own land. Do you know why? <clears throat> For us to reach out to them, to share the good news with them. Muslims are deceived, and I was one of them. My real name was Muhammad Kamel, with uh, a C, by the way, uh, with a K, not a C, you know. Uh, and I never heard anything uh, about Jesus. And most of the Muslims, they never read the Bible. And some Muslims are afraid to touch the Bible. Some Muslim leaders in different countries in Middle East telling Muslims the Bible is unclean. Don't touch it. And they are afraid even to take a Bible from you. I know uh, a Muslim guy, he is the son of the Saudi, Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabian uh, ambassador in, Fr in France, India, Mozambique, and uh, other country. This guy came to San Diego, and uh, we talk, I talked with him about Jesus, and he accepted Jesus, and he got baptized. And when he shared his story with me, he said, I used to have a towel to touch the Bible to move it away. You know, Muslims are afraid to touch the Bible in some countries. And I, I look to you guys as the fifth gospel. You know, even Muslims cannot hold the Bible, but they can see Jesus in your life. You can touch those Muslims by sharing the good news with them. And that's what happened with me uh, in Egypt. Uh, I know a friend of mine for 12 years. You can believe that? 12 years. He never shared the gospel with me. He was afraid to share the good news with me. He never told me, Jesus loves you. He never gave me a Bible for 12 years. And we know each other for a long time. And that's what's happening in churches today. People, you know, friends, co-worker, you know, Muslim or from different nationality. And we are afraid to share the gospel with them. You know, my friend, Muslims are cry out to us. Today, they cry out and telling us, please come and help us. Do you remember uh, the Apostle Paul in uh, Acts chapter 16? He saw a vision. In his vision, he saw a guy from Macedonia. And this guy in the vision was crying out to Paul telling him, come across and help us. Please, he was pleading, come and help us. My friend, a lot of people around you crying out to you, please share the gospel with us. Tell us about Jesus. Tell us how we can be saved. Don't be afraid, my friend. Today, the day of good news. And we remain silent. And in 2 Kings 7, 9, the rest of the verse telling us, if we remain silent till morning light, punishment will take over us. You know, we need to understand, you know, how God is working and what's happening now in the Middle East. People sometimes, they look to ISIS and they got scared and say, wow, ISIS is killing Christian." ISIS are strong, ISIS, ISIS. And most of the media try to use that to paralyze Christian. And Christian afraid. But let me tell you what God is doing. God allow this persecution to happen in Middle East to shake all the Middle East. And because of ISIS today, millions, Millions of Muslims are coming to know the Lord. You know why? Because they start to see the true Islam. They said, wow, if this is Islam, if this is the Islam we follow, and they left Islam by millions and millions. And God is 
revealing to Muslims today through vision and dreams. You believe that? Muslims in the Middle East, they see vision and dreams, and they wake up, and they start looking for Christians to tell us about Jesus, and go to churches. Half of churches now in the Middle East are Muslims attendants. Half of church like this, it will be Muslim from all uh, background, from Shia, from Sunnah. And I am in the Middle East. I go to Middle East, I see this, and I will show it to you, you know, to just change your perspective about what God is doing. God is shaking the nation. And he opens those countries for us, for the churches in Middle East to reach out uh, to Muslim. Let us uh, get Haggai, open Haggai. You guys call it Haggai or Haggai. Your English is weird, by the way. <laughs> yeah, the book of Haggai chapter two. And here is what God is doing. You know, if uh, we can get this verse uh, three times, the Lord telling Haggai to tell the people, be strong, be strong. Be strong, and to Joshua, three times, and then work, because I am with you. My friend, we need to be strong. We are in the right side. We are in the right side. We have a living God. You know, all prophets are dead, but Jesus alive, right? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. You know, all prophets from all religion are dead. But Jesus is alive. And by the way, Muslims believe Jesus is still alive. And Muslims believe Jesus will come again to judge the whole world. You know, be strong, be strong, be strong, and work. Church, we need to go to work. You know, coming to church on Sunday, it's awesome. Learning the word, great. Going to Bible study, great. You know, have a fellowship, great. But we need to work outside those doors and go and turn this area, all Idaho, upside down with the gospel. Look, look around you guys. Look around what you see. Just look. Look around you, around you what you see. Do you know what the Lord see? You are the army of the Lord in Idaho. You know, and each one of you can bring a thousand person to Christ. Each one. You know, and God can give you the power if you're really serious about God's business. And verse uh, 6 from Haggai, it tells us once more... I will shake heaven, earth, the land, the sea. Why? I will shake all nations to bring all nations to the desire of all nations. That's what God is doing. And that's what we need to understand. When we see persecution in the Middle East and when we see what Muslims are doing, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, because God is shaking those nations, starting with Tunisia. Tunisia, I don't know if uh, most of you know the story, uh, a, a Muslim guy burned himself because the government, the Muslim government, uh, was not fair to him. The whole city turned upside down, and they start fighting the Islamic government, and the king flee from Tunisia. And then Egypt fall down, and God shake Egypt. And all Muslim Brotherhood took over for one year in uh, 2013. And they were rejoicing that they took Egypt. But in one year, God raised a Muslim leader, and he took down all the Muslim leaders and put them in jails and prisons. And God is shaking Egypt. Now in Egypt, Muslims can attend the churches. You know, in Iraq, the largest church in Middle East, guess where? In Iraq, where ISIS is. ISIS tried to put fear 
and the heart of Christians there, the Christians say, no, we are strong. We will stand for, for the Lord. We will stand for the gospel. It's a huge church in Iraq, evangelical church. In, in, in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Iraq, by the way, one million Muslim came to know the Lord. Just in Iraq alone. In Egypt, three million Muslim came to know the Lord in the last five years. Uh, God is dealing with Muslim. God loves Muslim. And he show himself to them through vision and dreams. And sometimes they hear the Lord's voice. Do you know why God using vision and dreams to Muslim? Anyone catch it? Because the church is silent. God loves Muslims. God loves all nations. You know, and I believe God loves two nations now. He loves all nations, but he focuses all his work among two nations, Muslims and Jews. Do you know why? Because there are the two group of people who never hear the gospel. The rest of, of Christians, they hear the gospel. And I'm telling you, if you are a nominal Christian, if you are not real Christian yet, you know, your chance is very small because the door will get in close soon uh, for Christian. But the door is open for Muslim and Jew because they never heard about the truth. They never heard the message about Jesus. And that's what happening in Middle East. God shaking the nation and he wanted us to work with him. You know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I will give you three keys uh, you can use to reach anyone around you. When you see anyone, especially Muslim, in our culture, when you meet Muslim, don't hit them with the Bible when you meet them, you know? Talk about food. The first key is food. How many of you love food? Good. You know, then you are, very, you are a candidate for this ministry. You know, the second key, invite yourself to the home. You know, when you see a Muslim, tell him, wow, I, I love to taste your food. Can I come for a dinner today? And I know your culture, you know, that's something, you are, it's not easy to do. But in our culture, you know, say uh, Pastor Gordon uh, saw, see me in the street and say, Daniel, I wanted to eat at your home today. I will call my wife, hey, prepare food. Gordon, uh, Gordon is coming. And we rejoice he's coming. But if I met him in the street and tell him, hey, Gordon, I want to eat at your home today, do you know what he will do? He will take his cell phone and he will schedule me for six months in advance. <laughs> That's your culture. And I understand your culture. But in our culture, invite yourself to my house. And again, worst case scenario, they will kill you. But you are ready. <laughs> Guys, you will die anyway. <laughs> right? Why are you afraid to die in sharing the gospel? It does not make sense. You know, you can die by heart attack, by uh, cholesterol accident, you know, but dying in the field, that's the way you should choose. Amen? Amen. But nobody will kill you, you know. But I encourage you to go to the home. And by the way, this is Jesus' way. It's biblically to invite yourself to people's home. Jesus, when he saw Zacchaeus, what he told him, come down. I must eat at your home. Jesus did it. We need to do it. And the third key is, you can ask your Muslim friend and tell him, hey, by the way, I wanted to know more about Islam and I wanted to interview you. Do you mind if when I come, do interview about Islam? Most of the Muslim love the interview. You know, and I have like 50 questions I have it at my table in the back. You can ask for it. And if it's run out, you can always go to Kelly, you know, or uh, the church office and they can email it to you. Or you can go to our website and we can email it to you too. But three keys, talk about food, invite yourself, and the interview. 90% of 
American who follows those three keys, they end winning Muslim to Christ and baptize them in their church. Because it's a very simple way. You know, you talk about food, invite yourself, and then asking questions, you know, about Islam, and you can share your story and what Jesus did in your life. And that's what's happening, my friend, you know. Uh, a lot of Muslims are hearing God's voice, vision, dream. I have a lady in uh, uh, San Diego from Saudi Arabia. I will not mention her name for her security, but this lady was driving her car close to a church, big church in San Diego, and she heard a voice telling her, go to this church, worship me. And she thought, this is from Allah. And she went inside the church, she sat in the back, next to one of my students, and she was enjoying the worship and raising her hand. And after the meeting, my student told her, uh, where are you from? She said, from Saudi Arabia. She told her, wow, are you a Christian? She said, no, I am a Muslim, and I'm here to worship Allah. She said, wow, you need to meet with Daniel Messiah. And she arranged a meeting between me and my wife and her at Starbucks, and we start talking with her and showing her from the Bible and the Quran and through my testimony, you know, how Jesus loved her and Jesus can give her a new life and eternity, you know, uh, 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 secure her eternity. And the lady start crying like a baby. And she gave her life to Christ in a Starbucks and got baptized in this church. My friend, story after story, I, I will need three, four hours to explain to you how Jesus saving Muslims. Another lady, uh, I was driving in El Cajon City in San Diego. She started waving for me, and she was covered from head to toes. And when a Muslim lady waved to me, I know she wanted to share something important. I came close to her, she said, meet me at the library. I know where is the library, and I went there, I pulled the book, I pretended I'm reading, I sit next to her, told her, what's your story? She said, uh, you are Daniel Messiah, right? I said, yeah. She said, I heard you at Kiamaka College, you were sharing about Jesus, and I got confused because I'm a Muslim. I went back, and I was praying to Allah to show me the truth. Where is the truth? Is Islam or Christianity? And Jesus appeared to me in a vision. And now I put, I give my life to Jesus. And I wanted someone to teach me the Bible. Could you send someone for me? And we sent her, uh, one of uh, our uh, team members, a lady to teach her the Bible. Muslims are coming to know the Lord by millions and millions. And we baptize hundreds and hundreds. They estimated 350 million Muslims coming to, to Christ every year. 350 million a year. Yeah, you can clap for this. Yeah. And in fact, I will show you now a DVD from a very permanent, uh, famous leader in Egypt. His name is Zorbi, Sheikh Zorbi, the Imam. He is standing in Al Jazeera TV, not the 700 Club TV in Al Jazeera, and he was warning all Muslim leaders that the, the, the conversion of Muslim to Christianity in Sudan are very high, and he afraid in two years there will be no Muslim in Sudan. Sudan will be for Christ. Can we play this? <clears throat> it's DVD three, perfect. علمت أن من يدخل النصرانية في اليوم الواحد قرابة مئة مئة المهم الذي أود أن أقوله إن التنصير اشتد في الشمال أقول في الجنوب وأخشى إن بقي الأمر على ذلك لعامين فقط 
That's a report from a Muslim leader in Egypt. And by the way, when a Muslim leader from Egypt saying that, all Muslim nation respect this guy. He's very, very well known. And he warning all Muslim leader. Uh, Muslim are attending churches as we speak in all churches in Egypt, in Iraq, in Iran. God is opening the door for those Muslim because he's shaking the nation. Let us see what happened in Egyptian uh, churches. I believe that's uh, number four. By the way, this is my church in Egypt. That's the pastor of the church now. وإخوات لينا مسلمين دعناهم أصحابنا ممكن الضيوف مش اللي هيكرموا ممكن يقفوا ممكن كل إخواتنا المسلمين see how many people are standing in the church عندنا إخوات كتير قوي أصدقاء جايين النهاردة أهلا وسهلا 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 I will shake all nations, and all nations shall come to the desire of all nations. And this was my story. I was one like those Muslims. You know, Muslims are deceived, my friend. You know, the problem with Muslims, they think they following God. Like any other cult around us, you know, uh, they following the Prophet Muhammad, and they thought Prophet Muhammad is from God, and he gives them the Quran, and they didn't know anything about the true Islam is. You know, the Prophet Muhammad deceived those Muslims by taking 80% of the Bible, 80% of your Bible in the Quran. And he claimed that he got these stories of the Bible from God. And of course, the Arab at that time, they didn't have a book. They didn't know about the Bible, and they believe Muhammad, and they follow Muhammad, and they got deceived. You know, if you read the Quran carefully, there is 80% of the Old Testament, New Testament, and the prophets. You know, the story of uh, creation, Adam and Eve, Abraham, Sarah, uh, Isaac, Ishmael, uh, Exodus. Muhammad adopted all of this story, and put it in the Quran and said, Allah or God revealed it to him. Muslims, they didn't know that this stuff exists in Old Testament and New Testament. He did a little change to this story. For example, when he quoted a story, he always covered the blood of Jesus. He always covered the redemption work of Christ because he doesn't want it Muslim to see salvation of God. And uh, for example, uh, the story of Exodus. Do you remember when uh, God uh, pushed Pharaoh to release uh, the Jew? Uh, at that time, how many plagues God used? Anyone here studying the Bible? Ten. Ten plagues. In the Quran, he mentioned nine. Do you know which one is missing? The firstborn. The Passover. He didn't mention it in the Quran. Why? Because he doesn't want the people to see the salvation and the blood of Jesus can cover your sin. Muslim will start asking. That's how Muslim are deceived. And Muslim, they take everything about Christianity from Hollywood. And that's what happened with me. I was thinking Christianity like Hollywood. Exactly like you guys, when I mention Muslim, what first thing comes to your mind? Bombing, right? When I say, you know, Saudi Arabia or, you know, Islam, oh, bombing, they're coming to kill us. For Muslims, when you say Christians, they think about Hollywood. They think about your movies. And 
my favorite actor when I was a Muslim was East Clint Wood. <laughs> and I watch, and I watch his movies. And this guy is a terrible actor. And I thought if I come to a church like that, I will see them drinking liquor, dancing, committing bad stuff. That's why Muslim, they didn't bother to know about Christianity. Because they look at Christianity from Hollywood lens. Exactly like you. You look into Muslim through what? The media lens. And you're afraid of Muslim. You know, I enjoy my time with Muslim. I do debates. I go uh, in, in very dangerous places. And nobody touch me. I'm still alive. Because I believe I have Jesus in my side. I am in the winning side. And Jesus will protect me. If my time come, I will die anyway. You know? Why I will think about that? You know, and that's what happened with me. I was thinking if I come to a church like that, I would see women with bikinis and, you know, uh, they dancing, you know, liquors, you know. And one day, I have this Christian friend, and I got a crazy idea. I said, let me go to watch those crazy Christians in their churches and make fun of them and embarrass my friend. And I told my friend, could you please take me to your church? I'm interested in knowing more about uh, Christianity. He afraid to take me to his church. He thought I would put a bomb in his church. <laughs> he decided to take me to a different church. <laughs> See how Christians love each other? <laughs> Don't bomb my church, bomb the other church. <laughs> but I was glad he took me to the right church. The church, they see Muslim from God's perspective. They love Muslim. This is the church I showed to you just a few minutes ago. You know, they welcome Muslim. They love Muslim. And Muslim are knowing Jesus in this church, you know. And I was sitting in the back watching, you know, uh, Christian when the dancing start, when the liquor would be served, and nothing happened. And suddenly... Uh, the pastor uh, asked someone to lead them in prayer. I didn't know how Christians pray. I kicked my friend. I said, how you guys pray? He said, just close your eyes and listen to the prayer. I said to myself, he wanted me to close my eyes. Then they can do the bad thing inside the meeting. And I pretended I am looking. I'm, I'm closing, but I was looking to everyone. My friend, everyone around you is watching you. Everyone. Neighbors, co-worker, they wanted to see Jesus in you. If you didn't represent Jesus to those people, you know, they will never come to Christ. You are the fifth gospel. They can't get a copy of your Bible, but they can get hold of Jesus through you. And I was pretending I'm closing and watching everything, nothing happened. I got very disappointed you know, after the prayer. And I said to myself, maybe my friend told them I'm here. They will not do it today. I need to come more and more until they trust me. Then I can see the true Christian, what they doing in churches. And in our way to his home, I asked him, could you please write your prayer for me in a piece of paper? And he wrote the Lord's Prayer, Our Father in Heaven. And I took the prayer, and I was sitting, and I said, you know what, let me memorize it. In case anyone asked me to pray, I will, you know, I will repeat this prayer. Because in Islam, we, when we pray, we memorize verses from the Quran. Five times a day, we put our hands like this, and quote verses, or recite verses from the Quran. There is no relationship between Allah and the Muslim. He can't speak from his heart. It's all memorized verses. And I thought, Christian doing the same. And my friend wrote the Lord's Prayer. I took the prayer, and I went to his room. I closed the door, and I said, let me read the first line. And the first line was, Our Father in Heaven. I started laughing. 
And I said, Lord, those people are really crazy. They calling you father? I can call you Baba, Daddy. For a Muslim, this is, is a blasphemy. No Muslim dare to call Allah father. Allah in Islam is a master, and we are slaves in Islam. And here, I'm shocked by this prayer. Christians are calling God father. I open the window, and I start talking with God, but I was mocking the prayer. I start saying to God, you are my daddy? You married to my mom? When does that happen? You know, if, if there is a father, there is a mother. And there is a son. And that's how Muslims think. They never read your Bible. No one explains the truth to them. You see how they are deceived? And you guys have the truth. And you hold it. You're afraid. And I can't understand what you're afraid of. Even if they put you in prison here, your prison is like a hotel. <laughs> yeah, you have everything in the prison. You have bed, you have cover, you have hot water, shower, TV, cox cable, uh, play, uh, playground, everything. What are you afraid of? You know, I can't understand why Christians are afraid to spread the gospel. You know, people are dying in the Middle East. And here, we didn't want it to bother with the gospel. And I start mocking this prayer. You are my daddy. When does that happen? Uh, is that true? I can call you daddy. I can call you father. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit filled my room. And I start feeling God's arm around me. Even his face get close to my face. For the first time in my life, I felt God's love pouring in my heart. And he is hugging me. And I heard his voice very clearly. Yes, I am your daddy. I am your father. You know, this is my friend, was the breakdown point for me. And I start crying like a baby. And I told him, why you left me 23 years? Why you left me 23 years? And I discover God is my daddy. I start going to church, not to watch Christian anymore. And I asked my friend to give me his Bible. And I read the Gospel of Matthew and Mark in one day. I can't close it. And every time I read in the Bible, wow. Jesus preaching, Jesus' word. You know, how Jesus lay hands on people and heals them. Jesus create eyes for people. Jesus raised the dead. You know, Muhammad never did any miracle. No other prophet did any miracle. Nobody can save you. Nobody can heal you. Nobody can lift you up except Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord. And if you put your hope in a prophet or in a pastor or in a church, you will not be saved. You need to put your trust in Jesus Christ. And I start to see his power. You know, Jesus is alive. He conquered the grave. He conquered this. All prophet is dead. And sometimes I, I tease my Muslim friend, and asking them, where is Muhammad? They will say, Muhammad is dead. We know he's buried in Medina, in Saudi Arabia. I said, wow, where is Jesus? He will say Jesus is alive. Do you know, according to the Quran, Jesus is alive. According to the Quran, Jesus is coming back. According to the Quran, Jesus will judge the whole world. According to the Quran, Jesus is God. You know, and most of the Muslims, they can't see that. But if, if a Muslim seeking the truth will see that Jesus is God. In the Quran, Jesus is the word of Allah. Word of Allah. In the Quran, Jesus is the spirit of Allah. And Allah for Muslim is God. Which means, if you hear my word, my word is me. My spirit is me. Then Jesus is God. 
You know, it's very clear in the pages of the Quran. You know, all the miracle of Jesus, it's listed in the Quran. You know, Jesus can tell you about the future. Jesus raised the dead in the Quran. And when I started seeing that, I said, wow, I wanted to follow Jesus. This is the one I need to give my life to. And my church invited me to a conference in Alexandria. And uh, at that conference, the, the preacher was preaching, Jesus can change your life. Jesus can give you a new heart. It touched my heart because I remember in Islam many times, I, I, in, during the prayer in Islam, something in me was seeking change. You know, and I was crying inside, Allah, can you save me? You know, but there is no salvation in Islam. You know, nobody can change you in Islam. In any other religion, only in Christ, only in Jesus. And when I heard this guy saying this, I took a side and I nailed, and between me and God, and remember, I was a Muslim, my real name is Muhammad at the time, and I didn't know even how Christian pray. I prayed very short prayer. I said, Lord, if this guy telling the truth, change me. Change me, Lord. I was testing Jesus. It's really Jesus can change people. And boom, suddenly, a shower of the Holy Spirit came upon me and started washing me and shaking me. And everything changed in my life. And I started speaking in tongues. And I am in Presbyterian church, not a Calvary Chapel church not a Pentecostal church, not a symbol of God church, and here is Muhammad speaking with different language. That's what the Bible said, you know. Uh, in the last days, your, your people will see vision and dreams, and they will speak in tongues. And that's available by the Holy Spirit. And after this, my life changed completely. And I decided to spread the gospel to everywhere in Egypt without fear. I told the Lord I didn't want it to be like my friend. I didn't want it to be a Christian chicken like the rest of chicken in, in Egypt. And I stopped praying. I said, Lord, use my life to spread the gospel. And I make my commitment to share uh, the gospel with 10 people every day. I will not sleep. And I will count them, how many people I, I shared with. If I found I shared with eight, do you know what I will do? I will go even in the middle of the night. I will stop a taxi. And I will take a taxi a couple of blocks. And you can guess who is number nine, the taxi driver. I will share the gospel with the taxi driver, asking him to drop me after a few blocks. And I will take another taxi driver back home. That's my number 10. I start going in buses. He's standing in the bus, screaming, hey guys, have you heard about Jesus? Have you read the Bible? And this is a Muslim nation. This is a Muslim country, and the bus is crowded. And I, I ask God, give me new ideas. And one of the great ideas the Lord gave to me to go to the high-rising building, and I will go inside the elevator, and the minute the elevator is closed, I have a captive audience. <laughs> and I will share the gospel. Guys, I believe you can do that. You know, you, my God is the same, your God. The Holy Spirit are the same. Don't be afraid to spread the gospel to other people. And one day I was in a taxi and I was sharing the gospel with seven people in the taxi. After they left, the taxi driver started asking me, why are you sharing the gospel with us? We are Muslim. Did you ever see a Muslim become a Christian? I said, yes, I know. Uh, some Muslim became a Christian. He said, if you show me one, I will come to church with you. I said, me. He said, no, you are lying. You are a Christian. You're saying that. I said, no, here is my ID. And I showed him my ID. And he saw my name by itself, Muhammad Kamel. No Christian will call himself a Muhammad in the Middle East, <laughs> you know. And Muhammad Kamel, but it's required in our ID in Egypt to mark one of two boxes. Are you Muslim or are you Christian? And he saw the box Muslim is checked. I told him, you believe me now? You will come to church with me? 
He said, yeah, give me your church address. But he didn't show up in the church. He reported me to the secret police. And the secret police came to the church and they asked me to come with them for half an hour. And the half an hour became eight months in solitary confinement. No bed, no cover. I can't change my clothes, my underwear, no toilet. My toilet was a big coffee can with sharp edges. I used to take my shoes to cover the edges to use it. I'm not allowed to brush my teeth, uh, no hot water, nothing. One meal a day, and they put the meal on a rug, and this rug is dragged all through the prison, even through the bathroom, for the prisoner to pick the food. You see, that's my point. Your prison here is a hotel. <laughs> prison in Middle East is, is real solitary confinement. And I will give excuse for Christians there if, they, uh, if they're afraid to share. But uh, you have no excuse in the United States. You have no excuse. You need to go with the gospel. And they put me eight months in solitary confinement. But I was excited, guess what? Because now I have a captive audience of all prisoners <laughs> in prison. But what happened is, praise the Lord, they lock me in my room and I only allow five minutes free time to take my uh, can to clean it in the bathroom and bring it back. And all bugs was biting me, you know, in prison. And all prisoners became suspicious. They thought I'm a dangerous man. And all prisoners, one by one, start coming to my window and asking me why you are here. What's your crime? And I will tell them I was a Muslim, become a Christian. They say, wow, you're crazy. And I started spreading the gospel from my small window and telling them, God loves you. You are a child of God. God wanted to change your life. It's all from my small window. And all prisoners heard the gospel. And my nickname was Bishop Muhammad in, in the prison. <laughs> they took me for interrogation to, uh, in front of the attorney general uh, to ask me a question. That's before the prison. And during the interrogation, uh, I was praying, I said, Lord, you didn't bring me to this guy to ask me questions. Could you please give me something to this man? And this is the Attorney General of all Egypt. And suddenly, boom, the Holy Spirit gave me three questions for this guy. And I told him, Mr. Hisham, let me ask you three questions. If you answer them, I will renounce my faith in Christ and I will bring many Christians to Islam. But if you didn't answer those three questions, you need to read the Bible and take Christianity seriously. And the attorney general said, okay, go ahead. And the funny thing is now I am interrogating the attorney general. You see, that's how Jesus is funny, you know, turning all things upside down. I told him the first question, does Allah love you in Islam? And he said, I don't know. There is no love between Allah and sinner in the Quran. You can ask any Muslim, does Allah love you? His answer would be, I don't know. I told him the second question, if you die today, where are you going? He said, I don't know. Do you know, my friend, in the Quran, there is a verse telling Muslim, all Muslim are going to hell. Chapter 19, verse 71. وَمَا مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا Which means all Muslim will go to hell. There is no hope in Islam. There is no hope in any religion. You are wasting your time if you are a Muslim or involving in any other religion. The only assurance for heaven is Jesus Christ. He's the only one died for your sin. He's the only one died for you. 
and offer you eternal life. The attorney general of all Egypt, his answer was, I don't know. I told them, is Allah able to change you in Islam? That was my third question. He said, no, Allah will never change anybody. And the verse in the Quran, لا يغير الله قوما حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم Allah will never change anybody. You need to change yourself. I told him, Mr. Hisham, did you notice your answer? Allah does not love you. Allah will not take you to heaven. Allah is not able to change you. Why are you following Allah in Islam? Why are you following Allah? And the guy, his eyes was big. He never see anyone facing him with the truth like this. He turned the table and he asked me the same three questions. He told me, is God loves you in Christianity? I said, of course. God came from heaven to earth. He died on the cross. He gave me his life. Then I can live. He said, where are you going if you die today? I said, I'm going to heaven. And I can prove it to you in your office. He said, how? I said, I'm not afraid of you. You are the attorney general of all Egypt. With your signature, I will be behind the sun. That's an Egyptian expression, mean I will get disappeared. Even if you do that, I know where I'm going. I'm going to my daddy. I'm going to my father. I'm not afraid of you, Mr. Hisham. And he asked me the third question, is God changing people in Christianity? I said, of course. That's why I am in your office. <laughs> because Jesus changed my life. Praise the Lord. He can't find anything to put me in prison. And he asked me two sensitive questions. He told me, what do you think about the Quran? I told him, don't take it personally. Don't be sensitive. The Quran does not worth three pennies for me. And the guy who writes the report in his office, he asked him, sir, do you want me to write this? Because he will write blasphemy with his own hand. And Mr. Hisham said to him, yeah, you, you write this. The guy started shouting, oh, Allah, forgive me. Oh, Allah, forgive me. Oh, Allah, forgive me. You know, and then he asked me the second question. What do you think about the prophet Muhammad? Is he a prophet from God? I told him, don't be sensitive. Don't take it personally. Muhammad can be anything, but not a prophet from God. The guy asked him again, sir, do you want me to write this? He said, write this. He started shouting more and more. Oh, Allah, forgive me. Oh, Allah, forgive me. And they put me eight months in prison. But I was honored to suffer for Christ. And it was fun. And Jesus protected me. You know, you can imagine. I didn't brush my tooth for eight months. You know, you can imagine that. And after I got released, the first thing I did, I went to my dentist friend, a Christian doctor. I told him, could you please check my mouth? And he checked it and he said, you know what? I, I never see something like that. Your gum is healthy. Your gum has no bacteria effect. I can't do anything for you. Go in peace. And after a couple of months, I came back for him to see me. When he checked me, he said, wow, your mouth now full of bacteria. Did you see the difference? In prison, God has authority over the bacteria. No bacteria can come my mouth and hurt me because I am in my daddy's business. I am working for him. He will submit all disease, all power, try to harm me because he's the king of kings and Lord of Lords, and all authority has been given to him on earth and on heaven, you know? But when I, I got released, guess what? Now, I have doctors, they can help me, they can heal me, you know? He said, okay, let the bacteria go back, you know, <laughs> for his mouth. And I got married, and we moved to the state, and, you know, we were excited. We got our firstborn, Josh, in uh, San Diego, and, uh, my wife was uh, working as a nanny and taking care of some kids. And one day she took Joshua with her and she left Josh on the ground playing and she was busy with the other kids. And there was a swimming pool in the backyard 
and Josh start uh, learning how to walk. And suddenly, he start approaching the door uh, of the swimming pool and open it, and he fall down in the swimming pool and died. And my wife was not aware uh, of him. And after, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes, she finished. She started looking for him. Joshua disappeared from the house. She went outside, a couple of blocks, calling Josh, Josh, Josh. Josh, there is no response. When she came back to the house, she noticed in the swimming pool something in the middle of the swimming pool. She started approaching him, and she got him, but it was too late. He was dead. And she started screaming and screaming. All neighbor came. She called me on the phone, and she said, your son is dead. Your son is dead. Your son is dead. And this was the terrible news I ever heard in my life. And I was in a meeting in Costa Mesa Calvary Chapel with another pastor. He put me in the car. We went to the house. I saw many, many people in the front yard. I saw my wife at the corner and my son in the bag. And they have a yellow rope around him. And my wife cut her dress to piece. And she was carrying all the dirt over her head and hitting her face with her hands. And everything in here telling me few seconds she will lose her mind. I came close to her, I gave her a hug, was start crying together, but suddenly the Holy Spirit started speaking to me in my heart and reminding me with this verse. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he told me, go pray for your son. And it was great impact Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I went too close to him. They refused. The police said, no, you can't come close because it's an accident scene. But the pastor who brought me, he told them, I am his dad. They allowed me to come close. I kneel on my knees. And just with very short prayer, I said, Lord, show me your glory. I wanted to see your glory. And boom, my son starts screaming uh, from inside the bag. And everybody got shocked. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And they took him and they start treating him. Uh, he start crying more and more. They told me, we need to take him to the hospital. At the hospital, the doctor came to me with a big pocket full of water. He said, this is came from his lungs. Don't put your hope high. He will have a brain damage. Uh, he will lose his sight or hearing. He will be vegetable. And again, your English is weird, you know? Because the word vegetable, you know, means a vegetable we eat. But he meant brain damage with this word. And uh, he said, don't put your hope high. They wire him. And we saw a tiny baby covered with wires. They cut uh, both feet to feed him and monitors all around the room. And me and my wife, after we heard this news, and the doctor told us, he will forget about you. Don't put your hope high. We'll stop praying and making my commitment to the Lord. If you heal him completely, we will go anywhere you're sending us to. And we will go to reach out to the Muslim anywhere you're calling us to. And around 12 o'clock, my wife was feeling bad and tried to wake him up. And she started waking him up, Josh, Josh, Josh. Suddenly, Josh opened his eyes and he did like that to her. And that's how they play. That's how we teach our kids. When you see someone, do that to him, you know, in our culture. And uh, the minute he did that, my wife... Uh, no, in her heart, Jesus healed him. She carried him, she started screaming, uh, Jesus healed my son, Jesus healed my son. All the machines start peeping in the nursing room. Everybody rush, you crazy, what are you doing? She said, Jesus healed my son. And they check him, they said, you know what? We heard about miracles, but today we saw one. Your son is completely healed, but we need to keep him for 24 hours and you can come and pick him the second day. And we came the second day, we pick him up, 
and no brain damage and completely healed. Praise the Lord. He has, he has a teenage or brain damage, but that's okay. We can deal with it, right? Yeah. And the Lord will start uh, leading us uh, to plant the first Arabic church in San Diego. And from this church, God called me to be uh, the founder of Open the Gates Ministry to equip churches and encourage Christians to reach out to Muslims and go without fear, carry the gospel, the good news for people around them. And at the end, my friend, I wanted to show you the last video, a big revival in Egypt happening. 70,000 people uh, in the land of Egypt clapping and shouting Jesus' name in Arabic, Yesua. Clapping like that, Yesua means Jesus. In Egypt, uh, Christian, Muslim, Coptic, Catholic, all gather in the cave church for 12 hours to worship the Lord. And you will see stuff you never have it from your media. You can play it for us, please. See the joy of the people there. A flood of people. For the Lord, raise your hand. Amen. Death has no authority over us. See the Coptic priest, what the Coptic priest would do. That's a Coptic priest. There is no fear in the Middle East. God breaks the fear in the Middle East. And the power of Islam is broken, you know. And the Christian now in Egypt, they are not afraid. You know, my sister-in-law called us a couple of years ago when this has happened, you know, and she said, you guys need to come to Egypt. I said, why? She said, Muslim in the street is stopping us, asking us about Jesus and telling us, talk with us about Jesus. My friend, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We are in a free land, and we have freedom. And the word of God telling us in 2 Kings 7-9, today is the day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait till morning light, punishment will take over us. God bless you, and... Thank you so much for being real warrior for the Lord. <laughs>